I think folks are beaten down in, in the mining industry, at least those of us that have been investing in it for the past few years. Um, I think the, the generalists and, and uh, other investors that may or may not have experience investing in, in mining at all, they're distracted with other things. I mean, why not invest in large cap tech at this point? That's just been ripping higher the whole, before we see that really explosive run up in, uh, in juniors, we're going to have to see some generalists and some non-traditional mining investors come back into the space. We've just not seen that yet. Um, but w- with further price increases in the, in the metals, um, it just, just just a matter of time. Special coverage from the Rules Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida is brought to you by Contango Ore, developing Alaska's next gold mines. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially. Here from the floor of the Rules Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter, CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course, your host of the channel. And I'm welcome, or really happy to welcome Matt Geiger of MJG Capital, good friend of the podcast here, and really excited to see you again, Matt. It's been way too long. It has been. It's good to see you in person, Kai. Oh, really looking forward to the next 30, 40 minutes here with you, Matt. We got, we got to talk junior exploration, but also uh, macro. Macro meaning commodities. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on the overall like market environment for some of the commodities because your portfolio is quite heavily weighted towards copper these days. That's right. So I want to start there because 36% of your portfolio, I think, is uh, weighted towards copper. Let's start with the fundamentals of copper. Like how, how strong are they right now and where do you think the price is going? Well, good. We're, we're here on July 8th. I just sent out the uh, MJG partnership uh, uh, mid-year letter earlier today. So it was good to get that uh, finished up and distributed. And uh, that's right. Um, the letter uh, details our portfolio allocation by commodity, uh, by business model, and by jurisdiction. And uh, folks that, that read through that will note that we're 36% weighted uh, towards copper at the moment, which is by far our highest uh, weighting uh, towards the metal um, that we've had since the fund's inception. Um, I think a key point that I, that I really want to draw is obviously I'm positively inclined towards uh, copper price performance over the coming years. We wouldn't have such a high weighting otherwise. But I want to emphasize this is not a you know major macro bet per se, but rather a collection of I think six uh, different copper focused positions that I think have the opportunity t- uh, to see share price appreciation through catalysts independent of the copper price. So that could be success with the drill bit. That could be permitting success. Um, that could be uh, eventual M and A. Um, obviously, if the copper price works uh, works in our favor, then that will only will only serve as a tailwind. Um, but I do try to steer away from uh, you know what's what's self described as optionality uh, investing, and you know investing in projects that make no sense at the current metal price and need six, eight, ten dollar copper to make sense. That's really not not our style. So all of these all of these picks, um, if things go to plan, and of course there's uh, this industry is fraught with risk, uh, especially for any pre-production name. But if everything goes to plan, I see at least a double on the table for each of our investments, even were copper to stay flat at you know, 460 in perpetuity. So I, I do want to make that point. Now, like when, when you do your modeling, like how, how heavy do you weigh the copper price in it? Like what, what price do you use for your assumptions these days? Yeah, I think spot spot is reasonable. Um, if one wanted to get a little more aggressive, and again, this is not how we do it, but I, I feel very strongly and you talk to, talk to folks in the know in the industry, um, we're looking at an incentive price for the next wave of copper development projects to come online of 550, if not $6. So I would argue that copper is at least 25 percent below um, what the incentive price is to actually see the big boys get a move on these this next generation of projects. And and I should note, I mean, these copper projects, as, as you know, listeners will know, incredibly expensive, incredibly time consuming to build, fraught with technical risk along the way. So, of course, we can hit that six dollar number, but copper could run for years in, in theory after that before we actually see the supply come online. Um, Brian Dalton from Altius Minerals makes the point that in past cycles, oftentimes, especially for a metal with a, a long lag time like copper, sometimes you need to see twice the incentive price um, before these projects actually do come online. So I, I don't want uh, folks to think that once copper hits six dollars, you know, a, a switch is flicked and then, and then suddenly the world is flooded with copper. That's just just not how it works. Yeah. Well, time frame is is really important here. As That's well. right. So, um, when, when copper ran earlier in May. Um, how, how excited were you? I mean, it's like when you look at the portfolios, like were you actually thinking about maybe offloading some of the positions? Like how did the stock, the underlying stocks perform? Yeah, to be honest, um, and I think a lot of junior investors have, have seen this across the board. I mean, we, we had a good first half of the year. We were up around 14 and a half percent. So I'm pleased with our performance. But I think one of the, the, the key takeaways of the first half is that Mining equities writ large, whether you know, you're looking at the producers all the way down to the juniors, have failed to keep uh, pace with the metal price uh, increases that we've seen. 
Um, obviously, there's been promising price breakouts in gold, which is you know up mm-hmm. roughly 15 to 16 percent year to date. If you look at the GDX, GDXJ, XAU, um, the major gold producers are all lagging um, the, that that figure. Um, copper's up closer to 20 percent year to date. Um, you can look at the uh, the the X, XBM, uh, the base metals uh, ETF, and it's 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 you know right at 20 percent. So. At the, in the very best case, we've seen equities barely keep pace with the metal price increases, where over longer time frames, you would expect a 20% move in copper to see the equities up 40 or 50%, just given the leverage that they'll, that they'll uh, typically provide. So that has not occurred this year. <laughs> I don't think uh, I don't think that uh, that is broken by any means. It just it will take some time for for the equities to play to play catch up. But over shorter time frames, you can't have these uh, dislocations where metal prices can move and the in the equities don't follow. And and while that can be frustrating for investors, no doubt. I would actually argue, at kind of the glass half full perspective, that act, that actually bodes well uh, for the duration of this this move. Um, mm-hmm. I'm glad amongst equity investors, you know, folks didn't get super excited right off the bat, like we saw in the, uh, you know, post-COVID uh, 2020, uh, spring 2020, the late 2020 era with, with precious metal equities. I think this bodes well for kind of a, a move that will end up longer in duration, just because we've not seen that immediate reaction with the, the equities to date. Do you have an explanation for the lag? Like, what, what's your best guess? Like, why are we lagging behind so much? Like, sure. I'm also one of those investors. Like, come on. Like, when, when, when is it happening? You know, like, why that lag? Do you have an explanation for it? Yeah, I think I think folks are beaten down in, in the mining industry, at least those of us that have been investing in it for the past few years. Um, I think the, the generalists and, and uh, other investors that may or may not have experience investing in, in mining at all, they're distracted with other things. I mean, why not invest in large cap tech at this point? That's just been ripping higher. The whole 160, AI, 160% year to date on uh, Nvidia, for example. Oh, absolutely. Right. I mean, yes, S and P was up, you know, 15 odd percent in the first half of the year. So we, we barely uh, kept kept pace with with that. But if you if you actually look at the S and P equal equally weighted, it is closer to up four percent on the year. So that's just a, mm-hmm. another another instance of uh, of a big cap tech just like carrying carrying the day at the moment. And I think. You know, before we see that really explosive run up in uh, in juniors, we're going to have to see some generalists and some non traditional mining investors come back into the space. We've just not seen that yet. Um, but w- with further price increases in the in the metals, um, it's just just a matter of time. Yeah. Well, d- despite the run up in metals prices, we haven't even seen any money flow into the sector. And not even meaning share buy like buying shares directly, but financing as well. Like it has been slower. We've seen larger companies, of course, raise bigger amounts of money. So that's easy. Debt is easy to get. But once you're a smaller exploration company, you don't have a PFS or anything out yet, it, you're struggling to raise capital. I think I, that's right. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a little bit of a window that opened up maybe mid spring, um, you know, this six is a to very eight weeks. small window. Yeah. It was. It was. If, if you look at the chart of the TSXV, which is a, a proxy, albeit imperfect for, for the yeah. junior markets, there's a run up through the third week of May. Um, before we saw a pretty steep uh, uh, pullback through through the end of June. Um, perhaps that has something to do with the new uh, Canadian uh, income tax laws coming into place and some folks taking profits. But for whatever reason, um, that when that pullback started to occur, we saw we saw financing markets uh, dry up again. Um, there is capital available for the premium teams and for really exciting projects. I think that that point needs to be made. Um, but for your average junior out there that's mm-hmm. you know shuffling shuffling along and doesn't have anything too exciting to talk about, it's it's tough times. It really is. Yeah. What, what kind of trends are you seeing right now in this sector? When you look at the exploration space, like. What, what is working? What are you excited about? Uh, what, what are you tracking? Well, I can just say within our own portfolio, I mean, we're 31% exposed to prospect generators and royalty generators, which I understand is a business model that's entirely <laughs> out of out of favor at, at the moment. And yes, it does draw yawns amongst uh, amongst many investors. But I, I actually, I, I like that aspect of it. Yeah. I think the bar is set so low uh, that it'll be hard for some of these companies not to not to overcome it. So that, that's actually a business model that we, we really uh, keep close tabs on with the MJG fund. We have a proprietary model. We follow just shy of 40 different prospect mm-hmm. generators and rank them on four different metrics, updating that model on a monthly basis. Mm-hmm. So it gives a good sense, at least, of the relative valuations that you that you see within the uh, within the space. And uh, just just later in this conference, I'll be doing an expiration panel with some some sharp sharp mm-hmm. uh, expiration geos and um, uh, prospect generation and royalty generation will be one of the key uh, key topics that we'll be sure to touch on. I'm looking forward to that. Prospect generator is an interesting one. I'm curious your thoughts. Like, do you, do you want the prospect generator to drill one of their own projects at all, or do you want to stay? Uh, 
you want them more of a passive group? That's that's a great question, and that will I'm, I'm moderating the, moderating this discussion later this week. Oh and no, that is gonna I be didn't one see the, the title. Marquee, I did not see the title. That is going to be one of the marquee questions because that's one that I'm asked all the time, yeah. both by the CEOs of the companies that we're invested in, as well as other investors that are frequenting mm-hmm. the space. Um, look, I don't think there's a, a one size fits all answer. Um, I think there are some companies that have gone into it um, as kind of a hybrid project generator, and so that's already accepted by the market. Uh, one example would be Ridgeline Minerals, mm-hmm. uh, which is in uh, attendance here. It was actually the featured uh, investment uh, within the, the most recent MJG partnership letter. That's a company that has you know shown no hesitancy mm-hmm. to drill their own their own projects. Um, you know, uh, up to date and then partner out the ones that are compelling. But for one reason or another, the company doesn't have the bandwidth to push forward. So I think that model works. Um, However, for, you know, the purest prospect generators, um, if the CEO asked me, should we should we drill our own project? Um, My answer is no. Uh, (laughs) And then and then I see what the reaction is. And ever so often, these guys, even if they stuck to the model religiously for (laughs) five, 10, 15 years, they'll come across a a target that is so compelling that they cannot resist (laughs) but drill it themselves. And I think in those scenarios, then they should go for it, but understanding the risk if they if they come up dry. Yeah. Um, but of course, one of the one of the downsides of of violating the model, so to speak, uh, is that once you've done that and kind of broken the seal, then any other partner that you speak to is going to ask the question, well. Are, are we just getting the dregs of the portfolio? Hmm. You know, you got really excited enough and, yeah. and drilled this project up here in northern Quebec. Now you're trying to uh, you're trying to you know to pawn this one off. Yeah, on us. yeah. Like, like what 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 are we missing what, here? What's the problem with it? Yeah. Exactly. So it's 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 a it's a risk, and um, you know you have to understand that as a management team if you take that shot. And so I'll, I'll always push back. And if the management team is so compelled to still drill it anyway, we'll, we'll hang in there. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's there's consequences on the other side if it doesn't pan out. Yeah. Now, you U.S. based investor, so I'm curious, like, because part of your market musings was you, you talk about potential impacts of a presidential or change in the in the White House uh, mm-hmm. on, on certain climate policies, carbon credit markets. But I want to zoom out. Like, I, I just want to talk about general changes in mining, uh, as well, like Democrats versus Republicans. Like, has there anything been announced yet? What, what what are your expectations if there is a change in the White House potentially? What does that mean for the mining industry in the U.S.? Yeah, it's it's interesting. I'm not allowing that to factor into my you know individual uh, in, investment selections. I must say at the current moment that yeah. that may change. Um, I think more generally we are going to see uh, should should uh, President Trump win a, win a second term, um, we'll see quite a bit of the Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, uh, dismantled, and so I think that would mean less economic support for some of these critical mineral uh, projects. Um, that said, on the permitting track, things could could quite get quite a bit better. Um, so it's, it's likely to be a mixed a mixed bag there. Um, that, that may end up not being the case. Um, you know, it's possible that uh, Trump will keep in place the critical mineral um, incentives that have been put into place by the IRA. And I should say, I mean, Biden as a Democrat is one of the most pro mining uh, mm-hmm. Democratic presidents that we've that we've had, certainly and certainly in my lifetime. So I think the federal government has come a long way. And I, th- I think there is bipartisan support um, within the United States to push the, the, the right mining projects forward. But I should stress um, anybody that asks me this that's outside the mm-hmm. industry, Every single mining project has negative externalities. There, there's no such thing as a free lunch. There's always going to be environmental externalities. There's always going to be social externalities. But you can put all the projects on a spectrum. And there's some that are extremely disruptive on the environmental and or social front. And there's some that are less. And so I think uh, you know it's, it's important to, to recognize that as an investor and also for the government to have uh, discretion in terms of which projects that they're choosing to back. Yeah, I know. Like some of the guidelines in Nevada were rolled back uh, post uh, post Trump presidency as well. Like, do, do you expect them like Trump to reengage? Like, I think there was a sage cause uh, sage cause issue in, in in Nevada. He repealed a few things. Do you think that's going to come back? And so I'm curious, like, if there's any impact from that, like. Is there, is there anything you have an opinion on that? Well, I have been hearing within Nevada specifically that the BLM timelines have gotten a little bit long. Um, mm-hmm. So so it's possible that, you know, Trump re-injecting himself into the political <laughs> system will kind of jump jumpstart. No. Um, and I, I think it would likely, it would be neutral to, to modestly modestly positive. Yeah. But, you know, it, it could end, serve as a tailwind for U.S. focused projects. But as an investor, I wouldn't be, you know, stampeding into each and every U.S. focused junior on, <laughs> on the back of a, of a of a potential Trump victory. Yeah. I think you still have to go through your own investment projects uh, process, start <laughs> with the people, look at the asset yeah. quality uh, and then work your way down the list. And uh, if there is some tailwinds that, that occur um, in a potential Trump 
Trump victory, then great. But I, I don't think it, I mean, we have 25% of our, 24% of our portfolio exposed to the United States, but that's not a political bet by any means. No. That's, that's a circumstance of us finding specific investments that I like from a bottom-up fundamental perspective that happen to have US-based projects. Yeah. Let's run through the fund a little bit. I'm curious, like, um, like how much has changed over the last six to 12 months? It's been a while since we've spoken, mm -hmm. All right? Like, have, have your allocations shifted a bit? I'm just looking at allocation by jurisdiction. Canada, 28%, Brazil, 27 US, 24 But then there's a big drop off. That's right. All right. So run us a bit through the portfolio strategy here these days. How, how has it maybe changed over the last six months? Sure. So when, when we last talked, it was probably late, late last year, mid to late last year. And we were extremely quiet over the course of most of 2023. We made a couple new investments in the beginning of 2023. And then there's a seven month, seven month period where we didn't deploy any money into a single new name. We did dollar cost average in some existing investments and maybe participated in a placement or two with, with existing positions. We did not initiate any new positions over that entire period. Mm -hmm. and, and my thesis, and I was, I was dead wrong to be perfectly honest, I did not expect the weakness that we saw amongst the junior space last year absent a broader market breakdown. So I wasn't surprised to see junior weakness last year, but I was surprised to see it while the broader markets continued to melt up. I was anticipating that there would be a liquidity crisis of, of some sort, maybe not of the COVID 2020-like level, but, but, but one nonetheless. But it got to the point in early Q4 last year where the price action, the sentiment was so beaten down, where even though I hadn't seen that broader breakdown in the in the general market that I was anticipating, it, it was just time to plug plugs one's nose and, <laughs> uh, and and put some money to work. So we went from roughly a 13, 14% cash position, kind of uh, entering Q4 of last year, to doing four different uh, financings in very quick succession. Mm -hmm. um, two of them copper focused, um, two of them private, um, well, all private placements, but two of them private companies, two, two publicly traded. And by early 2024, uh, we were fully deployed. And, and that remains the case today. Um, and so we've, we've only made one new investment this year, um, a copper focused one, just, just, a few, uh, just a few weeks ago, at least when the, when the financing closed. But as of now, we're we're fully deployed and largely sitting tight with our with our positions. We've we've trimmed a trimmed a few uh, and actually liquidated three over the past uh, six months. So that's also an important point. So I'm always doing portfolio management, and at a fully deployed state, it's really a one in one out type of uh, type of mentality here. We're at 21 positions, and I really think it's important to to keep it tight. Um, and yeah, to to your point, you know, very uh, extremely copper focused at the moment. Um, we have a huge amount of exposure to Brazil. Uh, it's close to 30% of the of the portfolio. That actually comes from two different uh, positions, uh, both of which I, I wrote about in the most recent uh, MJG letter, Bravo Mining and, and Lara Exploration. I was actually able to, in, in one trip uh, in the summer of last year, visit both uh, both of the flagship projects there, Bravo's Luanga and uh, and Lara's Planalto project in the Carajás Mineral Province in, uh, in Pará State, Brazil. Um, so you know that that comes from two very high conviction positions. Um, that's enough Brazil exposure uh, for me. I actually am very positive um, on the company, uh, on the country, excuse me, from a mineral uh, perspective going forward. And either one to two investor letters back, I wrote up a long piece on on Brazil. Um, but we're, we're, we're content with those two uh, two positions at the moment. And then as mentioned, you know, healthy prospect generation, royalty generation exposure, healthy exposure to developers, and also healthy exposure to royalty and streaming names. I, I should note, we only have one producing uh, name within the portfolio, and that's kind of a theme going back to the MJG partnerships uh, inception. Mm -hmm. Most of the time we're investing in pre-revenue companies, but if we're investing in, in revenue generating mm -hmm. companies, it's almost always a royalty focused name. So I definitely have a, a bias towards that business model, understanding that when the mining market gets really rocking and rolling here, whether that's in one year or three years or five years out, the, the miners I think will outperform the royalty companies and will perform better leverage. But I think over longer time periods, it's, uh, that, that's a business model that we've stuck with. Yeah, just coming back to copper real quick, because you're so overweight. Like, I'm curious, like, what's your economic outlook? Like, when you look at copper, like you look at the copper price, it, it really fits my gut feeling of sentiment, right? And then, and now there's a bit of weakness. Like, what, what's your economic outlook? Like, how do you factor that in? Because you got to have a view or at least an opinion on it, even if it's just a personal one, right? Not an MJG capital <laughs> focus, right? But like, if, if let's assume the US hits a recession, like maybe a hard one, maybe it's a hard landing. Theoretically, copper should be dipping. Right. So curious, like how that fits into your allocation thesis and uh, how you look at that. Sure. So I try not to let macro judgments uh, cloud my investment decision making too much. 
Um, I guess I have the luxury of doing that by thinking along longer time frames, and that's one of the advantages of, of the way the fund has been set up. There's mm -hmm. a 10-year lockup for all investors, so I really do have the luxury of thinking three or five years down the line. Um, I do expect that there to be um, a market dislocation here in the next mm -hmm. 18 months, but I also expect within five years that we could be seeing $10 copper. Again, I'm not placing mm -hmm. bets, uh, you know, yeah. uh, assuming that, but I think that's very, very much within the realm within the realm of possibility. Um, if, you, if you look back to the last copper cycle between 2002 and 2011 and look at the, the magnitude of that move there, I think it was from roughly 60 cents uh, up to 450 at its peak in 2011. Um, if we were to apply that, that same order of magnitude to this move, um, starting at $2 in the depths of COVID, we would be up to six, $15, $16 yeah. copper. Again, that's not prediction. It's just that that's certainly within the realm of possibility. So I'm, I'm trying. I, I don't think I have an edge. Uh, I think a lot of folks are uh, really speculating on, on macro and let that heavily invest or influence their investment decisions. I'm much more focused on uh, you know thinking three or five years out. And if there's one or two sharp blips along the yeah. way, then we'll just add to our positions and, and, and carry on. Um, easier said than done, but it, it is doable. I mentioned to you before, you know, sitting down here as well. It's like uh, when I thought of preparing the interviews, like for some reason, Michael Berry kept coming back to my <laughs> mind and like he's, he's locked himself into the office. It's right. like, be patient. Hold the line. You know, hold the line. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He's like, we're, we're closing shop for redemptions that you have a 10 year limit anyway, so you can't redeem uh, your capital for 10 years anyway. But and then send a check. All right. Right. Yeah. Like sort of reminded me of that as well. well uh, I, I also should add, I do like names with with margins of, uh, of safety. I mean, we have one copper focus name. Uh, it's, it's very much on the early stage expiration side of things, but it's trading below its liquidation value at the moment. So its market cap is below its cash. Yeah. So even in an extreme scenario, when copper pulls back to, you know, should it pull back to three dollars yeah. again? Um, I'm not saying there won't be downside in this no. name, but it's it's going to be muted relative to your typical junior explorer that might have only four or five percent of its market cap covered by cash and a 60 to 70 percent drawdown is, is definitely within yeah. the realm of possibility there. So I do look for, you know, specific investment opportunities that maybe have some muted downside in the in the case of uh, of one of those outsized outcomes. I mean, an another example, company in attendance here, Kennerlin Minerals, uh, that's yeah. that's one of the names that I've written about in previous letters and then continually uh, update, um, including this most recent letter. Um, even after a really sharp uh, share price run up over the first half of this year, they're up 50 50 percent year to date. Um, they still have half of their market cap covered by cash and marketable security. So I really do like those uh, those instances. It doesn't doesn't mean that there can't be a drawdown uh, when we go into our next uh, risk off episode. Um, but relative to your average junior, your, your, your downside is at least somewhat insulated. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Kennerland. Centera came in for 9.9%, which is really good to see like a producer step in and, and support. Um, do, do we need to see more of that? Like, have the producers been too lazy or too, uh, too held back? Well, if the producers want to have new deposits to take into production over the course of the next 10 years, then yes. Um, I don't know. It's a double-edged sword. It's, it's great when uh, it's one of your one of your <laughs> companies that you're invested yeah. in and the, and the seniors come in. But ultimately, yeah, I think of it as a loaded spring. And the longer that the, the, the big boys drag their feet and kind of refuse to come downstream and, uh, and, and, uh, and help the juniors, um, the more pronounced the, the metal price moves are going to be at the end of the day. So um, if I were in charge of, of, one of, these, of one of these major minor com mining companies, I'd be very aggressive on the, on the M&A strategic investment side, signing earn in agreements, like getting your foot in the door before the mad rush comes, because it, it may not be this year, it may not be next year, but but it's coming. And I think that was a, a smart forward looking uh, move by Sentara that will will pay dividends for them. And it certainly paid dividends for, for Kennerland as well. I think the market really liked that deal. I was going to say, like, if you look at the valuations right now, it's like, why would you not invest right now? Right. Like, if, I know you're looking for deposits. They're not really investing for, you know, investing sake and actually making money and generating positive returns. But the valuations are so cheap, so you can get a bigger chunk of the pie for less money. Right. I think it's a win-win for Sentara. They're gonna they're exactly. gonna make money here, and they do have their foot in the door. And I think it would make sense for them to have you know some uh. preferential treatment for potential <laughs> deals that are that are on the table for some of Kennerland's assets. Like they're certainly gonna get, if not the first, maybe the second <laughs> call. Um, so I think I think it's a it's a smart deal in all respects from uh, from their perspective. No, fantastic. Like, maybe last question here, Matt. Like, what could get out the juniors juniors out of a funk? Like did the funk we're in, like this, the summer doldrums feel already dreadful. Um, what, what could break the ice here? I, I did. If you'd asked me eight weeks ago, I, I would have actually 
maybe not predicted, but felt more confident that we were actually going to have a summer to remember. And the summer doldrums are a real thing, but there are exceptions. Think back to 2016, where we had that rocking move from, you know, January, February timeframe through the fall. Or think back to 2020 is probably the most recent example yeah. where from, you know, spring through the end of the year, especially on the precious metal side. Because nobody could travel. We had to trade, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's less likely that we, we see a, a, a rocking summer here. But I'm actually quite bullish on the on the juniors near term absence of a broader market dislocation um i think what we the, the price breakouts that we've seen amongst the bellwether metals you know gold and copper namely look to be real um and look to potentially uh, extend extend further um and i think it's a it's a matter of time it's hard to know the exact trigger that's going to cause investors to trickle in um, but my best answer would be continued gains in the copper and or gold price no. to the point where these names look so cheap that it's just uh, it, there, there's no no option but for, for folks to come in. And it, it, look, it could, you know, it could help to have some of the, the senior uh, miners start to see these metal prices uh, reflect well on their on their future future earnings. These these moves are still relatively recent, so it might take a, a couple quarters for that to, to, to bake in. So we'll, we'll probably see the typical trickle okay. down that we have. I mean, the, the, the major producers have done better. Than the than the juniors, so that's that's kind of a uh, the start of, of a healthy move. Um, but I, I do think it's a matter of time. And if the broader markets hang in there and we don't have a, uh, a liquidity panic, I think we, we could see some strong moves later this year. Maybe not this summer, but maybe in the maybe in the late Q3, early Q4. Yeah, we, we just going. wrapped up Q2, so we, we should be able to see some uh, financials come out here very soon from the majors to see how twenty three hundred dollar gold on average reflects on the balance sheet. Yep. So it should be really interesting. Fantastic, Matt. Wonderful conversation. Always enjoy chatting with you. Thanks so much for making the time. Yes. Where can we follow you? Um, well, you can go to the MJG website <laughs> to see the most recent uh, letter. That's mjgcapital.com. And I'm also on Twitter at Geiger Counting. Um, You've been getting more active on there, I've seen. A little bit. Yeah, and yeah. I, I, I try. I, I try. It keeps popping up more often. Yeah, so. yeah. I no, guess. fantastic. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in here to Soar Financially from the Rule Symposium at uh, in Boca Raton, Florida. Really appreciate you tuning in. If you haven't done so, hit that like and subscribe button. Leave a comment. What do you think the junior market needs? Does it need more money? Does it need better people? Does it just need a trigger? Who knows? I'm curious. What, what do you think? Let us know. And uh, we'll be back with lots more here from Florida. Thank you so much for tuning in.